Hello and welcome to StoryWorks Roundtable tonight. Robert and I are discussing stakes and tension. So stakes and tension are like siblings or BFFs. They go hand in hand in any story. And the way I define them is that stakes are the thing you need to rise throughout your plot that the character faces. It's what the character stands to win or lose through each movement in the story, rising up to the climax. While tension is what you want your reader to feel. So tension is often an effect of stakes, but it can also be uh, more subtle, more nuanced than that. Sometimes our reader feels tension when the character doesn't because you've crafted the story so the reader knows more mm. than the character does in that moment, right? So it is important to think of them as two separate entities so that you can um, shape your story most effectively. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. I do love it when they get narrative tension right. It's the it's the old Hitchcock trick, isn't it? Where you know what the, the audience yeah. says, no, don't go in that room. Don't, don't. don't. Right. And, and then she goes in the room. <laughs> yes. Oh, stupid. <laughs> don't you read the script. I know. I know. Don't you know yeah. the killers behind that door? But so, mm -hmm. but where do you start? Do you start with the global stake of, of the particular story? And then the, when, the bit that I struggle with is, if you're writing a series as well, that how to keep up in the stakes without eventually ending up in the entire universe is going to drive up and die. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're writing. Oh boy, yeah. I think that. Um, so let's answer the series question first. I think if you're doing something like that, you need to have an idea of the final climax for the series when you begin sort of like in Harry Potter, the final book ends in all out war. So the books one through six, you've got increasingly dramatic, uh, traumatic battles, right? But she saves the war at Hogwarts, you know, on our home territory yeah. that we all have come to love for the final book. So you need to have that in mind in order to engineer each book's climax building up to that, mm. you know? And it's sort of the same on the novel level. Have a sense of what your climax is, even if it's a standalone novel. Have a sense of that big climax so that as you engineer the stakes through each chapter, you, you're you increasingly raising the stakes and tension and not, you know, going up and down all over the place. Yep. And to be clear, is it true that the stakes are best presented when they mean the most to the, to the character that we identify with the most in the book? Is is that, you know, because we can have high stakes, you know, so we, mm -hmm. the earth might be at stake. Mm -hmm. But, okay, so, you know, that might be no big deal. What's really at stake here is, is you know, is the, the lead character going to find his wife buried in the rubble? Mm -hmm. um, you know, exactly. is, is that you know, so? Yeah, okay. So, can you talk a bit more about that? Because I often get confused yeah. with, you know, well, what's at stake here is that someone needs to save the moon because it's going to break apart and fall on the earth, you know? Right. But that's not re what's really at stake. No, because, okay, so you always have to be asking yourself, who cares? And right. if you can't answer that, the reader, then you've got it wrong. It has to be the reader, down. not the characters, <laughs> not you, not your mom, <laughs> right? It's yeah, got yeah, to yeah. be Joe Stranger in Nebraska who's going to be, you know, nose in your book because the stakes and tension are so engaging. He can't put it down. So your, your stakes are about your protagonist. They're about the point of view yep. character who is the vehicle for the reader through the story. That's... That's it in a nutshell. Because as you were saying, the world could end, but who cares? We've seen yeah. 50 end of the world stories by the time we're 20, right? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not about the world ending. It's about the people we care about struggling through that apocalypse or finding a way to escape the world in time or whatever your, your plot entails. So step one 
is create a point of view character your readers are going to care about. Step two is put that yep. character in increasing danger with increasing stakes. So stakes aren't the same as danger. Stubbing your toe could be danger. Falling off a ladder yep. is increasing danger. A car crash is increasing yep. danger. But the stakes are what I stand to gain or lose as a result, as a result of, of that, that issue, yeah. right? Yeah. If I stub my toes and I was on my way to an award ceremony wearing a little black cocktail dress and open-toed sandals and now like my toenail is turning black and looks really disgusting, those are stakes. Because yep. stubbing your toe, yep. who cares? Nobody. Yeah, that's right. And I would have <laughs> worn heels anyway. Well, they're high heeled sandals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> so you see the difference though between danger and stakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and then the good. tension piece of yeah. it is the fact that the reader cares. So, if the reader doesn't care that Jill stubbed her toe on the way to the award ceremony, you don't have a story. Yeah. That has to be engaging, whether it's comedic or tragic. It just, we have to care about, about it. That's right. And the so this is where I think I can, I can personally get easily confused, so I imagine other people would potentially as well, is mm -hmm. you come up with a premise or an idea. You know, oh, what if there was a, a massive, you know, EMP event and it took out the internet? Well, okay, well, so everyone's thought of that. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and there are plenty of stories about that. And you think, well, those stakes are huge, you know. The, it, it, we could have people crashing into each other and, and the banking system would go down and there right. would be presents in bunkers and all that kind of stuff. But as you say, who cares? You know, when mm -hmm. you're reading it, it's got to matter to some character. And mm -hmm. it's got to matter to some character for a very good reason. So I suppose as soon as you have that idea, it's then good to ask yourself as case, well, who's my central character in this and why do they and what do they care about and why does this affect them? Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's like Y two K when that happened and people were thinking the banks will go down and the power grids will shut off and we're going to lose all of our infrastructures and stuff. How many of us were really that worried about the infrastructure as a whole, as opposed to, do I have enough fresh water? Do I have a generator? Do I have batteries? Mm. Do I have flashlights? Mm. Do I have mm. kerosene for my, you know, can I feed my family if this happens? So the, the danger might be this huge global thing, but the stakes people care about are intimate. Right. They're always intimate. Good. They're always intimate. So we've got to yep. separate danger from stakes. Even though they might be one and the same thing um, right. to one person. Right. It's only one and the same thing if you show that. And so, therefore, you've always got to, before you raise stakes, you've always got to show what the character is caring about and why it's mm -hmm. important to them. Right. Um, why does because this Because otherwise matter? raising the stakes, yeah, right, otherwise raising the stakes or, take, or, or putting the stakes at stake, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, putting what's important <laughs> at stake to them. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That's good. Right. right. And then let's build on that with the tension piece is that you might have, you know, um, Timmy is down the well. Who cares? Well, Timmy's parents care and Lassie cares and the local sheriff cares, but that's not what matters. The answer has to be the reader. That's where tension comes from. So before you put Timmy down the well, you've got to get the reader invested in Timmy and his family and his community and his dog. Then you can put yep. Timmy in the well and the reader will care. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Timmy. Yeah, we can't drown Timmy because Timmy's been helping all the, all the underprivileged kids. Who's going to help? Him? Yeah. Yes. He's such a nice boy. He deserves it. <laughs> Poor Timmy. Yeah, poor Timmy. Mm -hmm. So, okay, um, so just to carry on with that example a little bit more then, how would you make the reader care more about or the, or is it care more about Timmy or recognize that, or feel, you feel the tension, feel mm -hmm. Timmy's tension. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to, what will we do to increase the reader's sense of Timmy's tension in that, in that type of scenario? Well, you've got to introduce the characters and set up the conflict before you engage in the conflict. So 
we might meet Timmy and he's a sweet little boy, so we naturally like him. And Timmy's got this beautiful dog who's really smart and everybody loves dogs, so we like the dog. Okay, well, that's nice. But then what about, you know, the family? Why should we care about them? Well, they're daughter died of pneumonia last year and they're already heartbroken so to lose Timmy to a tragedy so soon is going to really break their hearts and ruin their lives so now we we are deeply empathetic toward the parents whose child is going to be put in danger and everybody loves a hero story and an animal story so we really want to see the dog rescue (laughs) the boy so there's a feel good element so all of these different pieces and threads can weave together to create that reader empathy and get the reader engaged in it. We don't want to suffer the parents' loss. We do like the boy and want to see him safe. And we love animal heroes. And so all of that comes into play. You can kind of pull whichever heartstrings are appropriate to your particular story. And if Timmy was then the protagonist then I suppose we might be in his head with him realising, unbeknownst to his parents, how important he is to healing them and that is something he's desperate for because he wants also to to be a family again Um, uh, after the death of his sister or whatever. Um, and, And then the thunderstorm breaks and the well starts filling up. Right. Well, and Timmy might be in the well, you know, childhood innocence thinking, oh, mom's going to be so mad because I'll be late for dinner now. I'd better hurry up and climb out, right? right? But he can't climb out. Yeah. It's too slippery. So now he's getting muddy. And then and he's he... he starts to, you know, cry and we feel sorry for him. And then the rain starts and then the well starts filling up. So now there's the ticking clock element. That's another yeah. great way to engage the reader's um, tension, to raise the tension is introduce some kind of yeah. a ticking clock. So... Lassie, go get help, boy, right? (laughs) Will Lassie find help? Will the adults listen to the dog? Will they understand and follow the dog? All of these things play into that scenario of making us worried because now Timmy's only got so many minutes left before he drowns. We've already established he can't climb out. We've already established the water is rising. You know, maybe in the scene prior to this, Lassie went and barked at the dad because he wanted to play and the dad was like get out of here i'm working you know you dumb dog and now we're like oh no yep. dad's not gonna listen <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's, i was listening to um uh sean coin's podcast the other day and he was talking about you know most stories if you were just to relate them in a, in a basic paragraph you know it just sounds stupid mm-hmm. you know this boy gets trapped in the well and the dog that everybody normally listens to, all of a sudden they don't listen to, and it, it um, mm-hmm. the boy nearly drowns, but in the end everyone <laughs> listens to the dog and they rescue him. And you go, oh, yeah, right, right okay. Um, yep. and every story is like that. You know that Lassie's going to rescue Timmy, but mm-hmm. it's the tension and the how and is the joy of reading a story like that, and it, especially mm-hmm. when, you know, and I know we've talked about this on other occasions, that whole, you know, it happens in a surprising way. You, you know it's got to happen. Right. But when the author manages to put it off in a surprising way, go, oh, that's how, you know, and he never saw it coming. I love it when it, when the mm-hmm. story is mm-hmm. like that, even though, as you say, you know, you know, Timmy's not going to drown. It's a kid's book. Yeah. Right. <laughs> not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> That'd be an awfully dark children's book if Timmy died. Oh, okay. <laughs> back to the the day Lassie was. failed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> dark fantasy. Yeah, yeah. The demon possessed Lassie and he bit Timmy's head off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that raises a really good point, though, what you just said about um, some kind of a twist and trying to surprise your readers. So you really want to work your way through these steps of increasing stakes and tension toward the climax, but make sure you play with every available possibility and really brainstorm and be outlandish be stupid, nobody's going to see your pre-writing material, and then pick the most surprising, twisty, fun, interesting, least expected. Go for the weird and see where it takes you. You might be 
really surprised what you can come up with. And that's going to in turn more fully engage your reader because of the, the surprise factor. Yeah, well, and as you say, you know, that sort of takes it from a, a basic, oh, okay, we've got to save the Earth from an asteroid. Here, here we go, another one of those movies mm-hmm. where you, you know they're going to do it. And, yeah, big deal. Okay, so they nuke it in the end. Right. Well, wow, mm-hmm. that was really interesting. Um, but is there something else? Is there a different way? And, for example, reading um, uh, Neil Stevenson's um, Seven Eves recently, that, that's a fast – I mean, it's a, it's a big book and it's not for everybody in the sense mm-hmm. that he likes to uh, show you how much science he's thought through in the book. Uh. Um, so it, it can get a bit we- you know, wearing if you're not into that. Um, but the idea that um, that the moon actually does break up and and causes all these issues. So, and they they don't they don't circumvent it. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the the Earth basically life as we know, Jim, <laughs> has ended. Right, um, right. And so the human race has to kind of reinvent itself. Um, and so the, the stakes are based around will the various different points of view that we have be amongst the people who effectively get the elitist positions um, in this you mm-hmm. know, super, super huge kind of space station structure they're trying to build. Um, and will that, in fact, even work? They don't know. Yeah. You know. So it's a clever way to look at the end of the world because it's meaningful to a handful of characters, mm-hmm. uh, but not done in a really obvious way where, oh, yeah, we're just going to do this or do that. Mm-hmm. So clever, clever in the sense that the stakes are humankind stakes but it's a it is a very personal story right well and that's key to any story is making it personal you know you Mm. can't have generic characters with generic lives because even though it might seem like that every man character is someone anyone can relate to it's actually just the opposite the specificity is what draws us in to a character's life or to a scenario. It's what makes us care about it. So all of that mm. scientific research you're talking about him doing and all he that writer knew learned the consequences of what would happen in his plot in order to make it a plausible story. Yeah. You know, and he might yeah. have taken broad creative license. I haven't read it, but he structured it in such a way that the reader can get in that story and find it plausible and not be pulled out going, well, I don't think it would work that way, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah specificity. You, I, <laughs> I think it's probably why he took such great pains with the science because, you know, he, he knew that there'd be a whole load of geeks onto it, taking mm-hmm. it apart and missing the point of the story, you know, which was the, the personal stuff. And I think that's a delicate balance if you do have a, a story that's very involved in in hard science or hard fact or mm-hmm. or historical fiction is to not let that get in the way of or not not let yourself be seduced by those being the stakes because they're not as you i think you said it correctly stakes are only stakes if they're personal right right yep so maybe, yeah maybe that's what it ultimately boils down to like the y2k thing you know, mm-hmm. I don't really care if Wall Street falls over. I just want to know, can I still get my money out tomorrow? <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, oh, if the banks collapse, does that mean everyone will be debt-free all of a sudden? Hey, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Party. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's not the end of the world at all. It's right. a new beginning. <laughs> Ooh, we get to start over. It's like being 18 again with no debt. And <laughs> yes. Oh, all right. So that's well. That's been great. I really, I've actually helped me crystallise some things because I have, as I said, I have struggled with confusing stakes with the kind of grand premise of threat mm-hmm. and danger. Mm-hmm. The way you separate um, danger and stakes, or treat them differently. You know, mm-hmm. they can be one and the same. They matter to that person, um, right. as you say. But uh, but they uh, danger is not automatically equal to the stakes. So right, great. right. Well, and let's just quickly look at Timmy again. When he first falls down the well, the reader is going to have increased tension because the reader knows more than Timmy, who's a child. So Timmy's stakes are, oh, no, mom's going to be mad because I'll be late for dinner. But the reader's tension is, oh, no, Timmy's going to, you know, break a leg, starve to death, you know, be Brown. drowned, whatever, <laughs> never be found. So you've got a big disparity between the character's stakes and the reader's tension, but that's working for you in that case. You want the reader's tension 
to be high. And then, you know, as dusk comes on, Timmy's going to be frightened and he might hear like a coyote howling somewhere. So now Timmy's stakes are increasing because there's the element of fear. And then the thunderstorm starts and there's rain. So now Timmy's afraid. He's cold. He's wet. Nobody knows where he is. And he might not realize the danger of drowning yet. So that might not. Mm. Mm. It's a stake in the story because the reader's aware of it. But for Timmy, he might not even realize that's a danger because the water's just up to his ankles, you know. So you really need to think of danger, stakes, and tension as three elements that you get to break together and play with to construct the best story. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I had some things running through my head there about <laughs> Batman. <laughs> Batman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's hilarious. There's, there's that one, I think it's in the Batman movie, the original ones with Adam West, and uh, where he's he's managed to get the bomb away from the villain. And it's one of those, you know, big round bombs with the fuse mm, on the top. Uh-huh. And, he and he and Robin, they're on the wharf and they're they're running around trying to find somewhere to, to throw it. To throw and it. The bomb's going to go off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And everywhere they run, they run up to the edge. Oh, there's a woman with a stroller. Oh, no, we can't go there. They run to the other edge and there's some nuns. No, we can't go there. They run to the other edge and there's a school party. Go, ah. And he turns to Robin. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> that is a but, good yeah, example like of increasing like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah of increasing the tension because i'm sure the wick is you know hissing and yeah, yeah, sparking exactly. and yeah, stuff yeah. as it's getting shorter that's and right. shorter so that's your ticking clock in this example and then exactly. it's comedic instead of tragic so even if you're writing a, a funny piece you've got to still work with these elements it's just to a different effect you know it's easier yeah. to talk about them in the tragic sense but it functions the same way in comedy. Yes, like, like oh, when Austin Powers is about to be trying to, be, it's going to be run over by that steamroller thing, and it's just, it's just inching along. <laughs> when the camera kind of zooms into it, and then it zooms back, and it's still five feet away. <laughs> it's serious. Anyway, yes. It's so yes, tension can be humorous, and should be, I think, in, in in good humor writing anyway. Yeah, yeah, humor should definitely have tension but it's building up to the big laugh to the you know sort of the climactic laugh yes to the release of tension in either scenario it's a release of tension that finishes that movement whether it's averting tragedy or coping with tragedy or the punchline is finally delivered you know Mm. well on that note shall we (laughs) shall we wrap it up (laughs) I think we're without attention. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are going to release tension now. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. You can find all of our episodes at storyworkspodcast.com. <laughs>